Welcome and thank you very much for being here. As you know, in this class, we are going to discuss about T.S. Eliot's important poem, The Wasteland. Before I start, I want to make a confession to you. See, if you become an assistant professor tomorrow, or if you were to teach this poem, you will never ever feel that you have done justice to this because this is a phenomenal poem and you know how difficult it is. So before I start, I say, this is what you may call the minimal thing we can do. So I want to give, provide, start with, uh, it's a very two-part session, background information and section-wise analysis. And when you come to Wasteland, uh, you know, it's uh, published in 1920, 1922, and it has got 434 lines. Somewhere I read it is 433. Uh, and when I looked at the poem, uh, and I felt it for 434, uh, so both chances I leave either 433 or 434 and we need to understand the context of this poem remember it was written at the time after the first world war where as I told you uh, 8.5 million soldiers and 13.5 million civilians were officially dead and it was a time of um, despair disillusion lack of hope uh, so and also El Eliot was personally undergoing a lot of personal problem his wife's mental uh, illness was uh, at the height between 1920s and 30s so ultimately he was undergoing himself a kind of a despair and disillusion and uh, you know this poem is known for a lot of myths actually i have been preparing using this uh, cd thomas text and uh, this poem has got 40 things, uh, including the explanation uh, that could even run into a small novella. You know that. He uh, quotes from Bible, Greek, Roman mythologies, Eastern mythology, philosophy, and works of literature. And if they ask from that, we are totally helpless. And if you look at the themes, uh, it's a crisis of modernity, search for meaning. As I told you, both uh, personally and also the world was looking for meaning. And disillusionment of religion and brokenness of relationship, you know, the multiple images comes in uh, sections 2 and section 3. Spokes of uh, relationship, we will go that part. And a cycle of life and death, which is something uh, b b b comes from Eastern uh, philosophy. Nine things I would like to say about uh, uh, T.S. Eliot, initially as an introduction, the first part is that uh, literally modernism is unimaginable without Eliot. That's a quotation. So about whom this is said, you must understand that it is said about T.S. Eliot. And second point, everybody knows he's central to Anglo-American poets, that is both England and America. He has contributed to both literary criticism. And third point, again, you know that he stands among with the poet critic tradition. Actually, it started with Philip Sidney, then went on to Samuel Johnson, Coleridge, then Matthew Arnold and T.S. Eliot. So, and uh, Dylan Thomas famously called T.S. Eliot as the pop in literature. So, which person is known as the pop? Remember, it is Dylan Thomas said about T.S. Eliot. And another expression commonly heard is that the literary dictator. It is said about T.S. Eliot and it is called by a critic which we have fortunately not studied, Delmore Schwartz. Delmore Schwartz. And as you know, he won Nobel Prize for literature in 1948. Nobody is going to ask, but still we know. And if you go on to a section-wise analysis, uh, as you know, it has five sessions. We must remember the name, The Burial of the Dead, A Game of Chess, The Fire Sermon, that is what I said, it's Buddha, and Death by Water, and What the Thunder Said. So uh, what we are trying to do is we are just uh, going doing this one by one. Give me a sec. So uh, we start with the setting uh, of the poem. Uh, remember uh, in the beginning you know that uh, it's uh, reverses uh, the land april is a cruelest month it starts like that uh, it's uh, speaks of what you may call uh, transition to a sterile and lifeless uh, life uh, it, spe it speaks of uh, what you may call a biblical story of lazarus and the dead land suggesting a hybrid setting of spirituality and mythological and if you look at the voice of the poem we can understand that there are mul multiple uh, fragmented voices uh, actually, we feel like it's Eliot, but it's a reflective persona, including Mary, a past event, you know, how her cousin was taken uh, Mary to a top and how they slided, hold on Mary tight, you remember those. And there is a German speaking voice. So it's a recollection there. And if you look at the characters, uh, uh, it's Mary, obviously she's German. And uh, there is a also a Greek prophet, Tiresias. And if you look at the imagery, uh, there are some dead land, forgetful snow. 
a disconnected unreal city and if you look at uh, uh, the summary of that session it's very difficult we can understand that there is an inversion of the traditional spring time uh, basically april is a good month but here it inverses and uh, it's uh, presented uh, as a, what you may call as time of a death rather than rebirth because spring is a time of rebirth you know that and uh, here uh, a character named mary uh, shares her personal memories of carefree past uh, which contrasts with the game uh, present so actually you know you always feel good in the past and uh, it's a uh, ending with uh, what you may call a vision of uh, what a london bridge uh, a lifeless and mechanical way so uh, that is the sum of that and now we come to game of chess and you know the setting is in a a uh, pub an opulent pub uh, and uh, you remember towards the end uh, it's written in bold hurry up please hurry up please that is the sound of the pub owner to ask them to so you see an uh, a woman who is a very rich woman uh, this uh, uh, jewelry is described and how it uh, shines in the glass everything and it sometimes it uh, remember the setting of antony and cleopatra uh, they are in a pub and uh, if you look at the voice um, it's a third person voice comes there and uh, it between a man and a dialogue and uh, the man asks about uh, the other person and albert her husband most probably and uh, finally we have the voice of the pub owner saying that hurry up please and uh, there is a love uh, what do we call love is it true love i don't know indiscreet love uh, and if you sum up that part we can understand that uh, a failed sexual encounter between two unnamed characters uh, and two contrasting environment uh, and uh, uh, a rich woman which for a lover who never shows up and the scene shift to a conversation between a man and a woman in the pub and it's very difficult to understand it and the fire sermon again we move on to the london uh, uh, river thames you know how the image of fishing is there and how clean london river is without uh, chubs and all everything is beautifully described and also there is a sexually charged scene in this and uh, remember this part is uh, said by uh, tiresias uh, a blind prophet and he can also transit between uh, two genders as you know and here he also speaks about two characters in that uh, a young clerk and a ty- typist and if you look at that um, it speaks about um, how she returns she prepares uh, food and waits for lover it's a very what you may call minimal setup there is a divan and um, once the sexual ex- encounter was over she is relieved uh, that is uh, it's over though uh, she uh, is very what you may call wanted it but unfortunately uh, her partner is not that much uh, he's mechanical and soulless and uh, again it ends with uh, what you may call the river thames it's very uh, remember and that by water you know it's a very short test uh, session with just 10 lines and uh, its uh, setting is uh, underwater grave which suggests uh, death drawn uh, there is a uh, what you may call a reference to a drawn figure and if you look at the character it's uh, taken from the tempest ferdinand uh, a drawn sailor and if you sum up it's very it's very hard uh, you know it's a short section as i know you're describing a drawn man in the ocean possibly a sailor symbolizing death and uh, uh, also potentially transformation we have to die in order to renew and uh, what the thunder said thunder as you know with thunder comes what rain so rain is always a suggestion for a rebirth so uh, that that's why the poem ends with uh, in a come what a positive note Uh, give me a sec yeah uh, so uh, th- so now from post apocalyptic to this uh, poem moves towards a very positive what do we call uh, india uh, mythical land uh, ganges uh, and uh, there are multiple voices uh, characters allusions it's a very what do we call uh, lengthy part also and uh, as you know the thunder which is uh, always uh, seen as a potential thing a rebirth and uh, you know the ending shanti om shanti 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 and very positive and the three words the thunder's message which is uh, i'm not good in sanskrit uh, datha daivad datha dayadvam and damayata uh, so we means give sim- uh, sympathize and control that means uh, it's to it's also means charity Uh, so it means a potential what you may call a path towards healing so uh, it's very so ultimately uh, the poem uh, the last part poem is a, it's a land waiting for what you may call a barren land waiting for rain and a rebel of thunder there is a hint of hope this there and uh, it's a thunder's message is also a call to humanity it's time to change it's a wake up call sympathize and control and uh, what you may call so give sympathize and control so be charitable that is what it says and be uh, love each other it could be all the messages uh, so ultimately he, uh, the poem ends with uh, we need for a healing uh, after such a devastation so uh, powerfully written beautiful and remember this is uh, uh, the shortest thing that i can do f- and as i told you in the beginning i'm not happy with my performance but based on the time limit we have hopefully it was useful to you thank you very much for watching 
and uh, I'll see you in the next class. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.